Well, protesters poured into Seattle's City Hall last night, and it was Council Member Shama Sawant who led that large group inside calling for police reform and also the firing of Mayor Jenny Durkin. King 5's Chris Daniels is joining us live. Yeah, Jessica, there is a review of the Seattle police budget going on right now in a virtual Seattle City Council meeting. The council calling this an inquest of the police department budget. Now, this has all been prompted by the death of George Floyd and the reaction by Seattle police to protests here within the city. Today, the city's budget office laid out PowerPoints showing a 2020 budget of $409 million, 82% of that for personnel. Now, people are calling for defunding the police, but it is likely line items will be examined, like the amount of money used for demonstrations, $67,000 this year. The budget office says the city could save, for instance, $40,000 a year by not purchasing blast balls and tear gas. And all of this conversation is folding into a larger discussion about cutting city spending because of revenue shortfalls related to the coronavirus outbreak and economic fallout. Councilmember Teresa Mosqueda says the council is still waiting on the mayor's office. They have asked for additional time, um, at least a week, potentially more, for them to um, respond to the crisis that I think everybody is seeing in the street. And I, um, I am looking forward to receiving that budget. I think that that's potentially good news that the words and the call from community have been heard and they've held on to that budget to do some additional amendments before they send it down. And this is a process which could take several weeks. Council member Shama Sawat is part of this meeting. She was also part of a rally yesterday in which she is alleged to have allowed some of the protesters to come inside City Hall. We learned today there has been a formal complaint filed with the city by a city employee who believes that the union janitorial staff's health was put at risk by that demonstration. And they also allege that a piece of artwork on the second floor of City Hall was damaged by one of those protesters. Live at Seattle City Hall, I'm Chris Daniels, King 5 News. Well, Chris, is the council talking at all about a full-scale defunding of the police department? Yeah, it's a great question, Joyce, because that word defunding means different things to different people. You hear from SWAT, it means eliminating all of the funding. You hear from somebody like Mosqueda, it means cutting back by half or more. And then there are others who believe that going line item by line item would allow a reimagining of the police department. So there's a lot to discuss here over the next several weeks. All right, Chris Daniels reporting live for us. Thank you. Well, a 31 year old accused of driving through this crowd and shooting at protesters in Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood on Sunday night is now facing a class A felony. Nicholas Alexander's charged with one count of assault in the first degree. In court today, he told attorneys that he was acting in self-defense. The judge set his bail at $150,000. Just a day after laying his brother to rest, George Floyd's brother went to Capitol Hill demanding a change in our country. Philanise Floyd gave passionate testimony, saying he hopes his brother's death will change the world for the better. I'm here to ask you to make it stop. Stop the pain. Stop us from being tired. George called for help and he was ignored. Please listen to the call I'm making to you now, to the calls of our family and the calls ringing out the streets across the world. People of all backgrounds, genders and races have come together to demand change. Honor them, honor George and make the necessary changes that make law enforcement the solution and not the problem. Hold them accountable when they do something wrong. Teach them what it means to treat people with empathy and respect. Teach them what necessary force is. Teach them that deadly force should be used rarely and only when life is at risk. George wasn't hurting anyone that day. He didn't deserve to die over $20. I'm asking you, is that what a, is that what a black man is worth? $20? This is 2020. Enough is enough. The people marching in the streets are telling you enough is enough. 
such a powerful moment, Joyce, and I think there's no one that doesn't see that and say what strength and resolve and determination it takes to go one day after burying your brother to go speak with lawmakers like that. Just incredible. He was so emotional, too, and of all of the things he said, all of it so powerful. I remember specifically him saying that it was been really hard for his family to watch that video mm. over and over yeah. um, because it just looked like nobody cared, that the officers didn't care. And, you know, he said his brother's life mattered, that black lives matter, and he wants, he was pleading with lawmakers to make sure that his brother's life uh, would not have been lost in vain. Yeah. It was really. Quite, quite something. Quite a moment. Mm -hmm. You know, just less than 30 minutes ago, I spoke to Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, a member of that House committee that held today's hearing, and she talked about the need for police reform. If we had already banned chokeholds, George Floyd would be alive. If we had already banned no-knock warrants, Breonna Taylor would have been alive. If we had already pushed for a demilitarization of the police force and push to have officers misconduct, follow them from job to job, we would have saved lives. And so now it is incumbent upon us, as Felony Floyd said, to pass this piece of legislation, to respond to the calls, the urgent calls from across this country, to pay attention and put force behind the words Black Lives Matter. Jai Paul said there's bipartisan support for sweeping reform, uh, but still no word on how far uh, each side may be willing to compromise on all that Democrats are asking for, something that they can actually get to the president's desk for him to sign. Meanwhile, the family of Manuel Ellis, the man who died at the hands of Tacoma police, are getting what they asked for. They wanted the state, not Pierce County detectives, to investigate his death. And today, the prosecutor agreed. King 5's Drew Mickelson explains why. In the final moments of his life, Manuel Ellis's family believes he was being respectful to Tacoma police and should not have been killed. Police said he was trying to open car doors in March, and when they stopped him, he tackled one of the officers and had to be restrained. The medical examiner ruled Ellis's death a homicide due to lack of oxygen due to physical restraint. An autopsy found Ellis had methamphetamine in his system and heart disease. Pierce County detectives were heading up the investigation and were set to present the case to the county prosecutor, but when she learned a Pierce County deputy had been on scene that night, she passed the case onto the state for a separate agency to investigate. I don't know to what extent, uh, but I think that's enough that in the appearance of fairness and the uh, integrity of independence that, uh, uh, that maybe the sheriff's department, uh, you know, that maybe this should be reviewed now by the state since state review is inevitable. The whole circumstance has been remarkably difficult uh, for them to move through. Ellis family attorney James Bible says the family is glad they got what they asked for. I think that it makes sense anytime we're in a space where there is uh, a death caused by officers that the prosecutor's office actually relies on on a daily basis for there to be a recusal and for the state to actually step in. I, I absolutely am glad that, that, this, that the state's going to take over and we're going to get a, a fair and impartial um, and independent investigation. And despite the change, Tacoma Mayor Victoria Woodard Still is not backing down from her statement last week calling for the officers, officers to be fired and charged. Is it too early to say that the officers should be fired? We haven't we haven't seen the whole the whole case yet. I was, but you was clear, based on what I, I have a coroner's report that says it was homicide. Drew Mickelson, King 5 News. Well, after several days of protests, including some violent clashes between police and demonstrators on Capitol Hill, SPD reopened the streets. It means people can march in front of the East Precinct, but as King 5's Natalie Swaby shows us, protesters have set up tents instead. The perimeter stretches from here at 13th Avenue, goes past 11th Avenue, and it goes from Olive to Pike. The protesters we talked with here today say at this point they don't have any plans to leave. You want to call it anything, it's the people's community. Rooks is one of the protesters spreading a message. That's what those faces on the walls, black lives killed by the police. Lives lost in Washington state are posted on the side of the East Precinct, where the sign above now says Seattle People Department. And on the corner, the words, welcome to Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. We call it Free Capitol Hill for a reason. It's, 
it's a community. Like that's what I was overwhelmingly hit with when I came in yesterday morning to see it for the first time. It Lauren Smith works at a nearby restaurant. She says since police pulled back and protesters moved in, it's been peaceful. I feel safe again <laughs> for starters. It's a beautiful sight to be able to come in and open up my doors as usual. But this has created obstacles. What kind of aid are you trying to provide here? If you don't have a plan to pick up the garbage, it's gonna become a health and safety issue. We need to have to find access routes. Fire Chief Harold Scoggins wants to make sure medical aid and emergency vehicles can get in. Yesterday, Police Chief Carmen Best met with the protesters. Well, I think the, the minor things that we disagree on are things like blocking the street. You know, the very thing that people ask us not to do uh, they're doing. Today, SPD says they're concerned about safety and their goal is to reopen the precinct. According to Assistant Chief Deanna Nolette, they've seen checkpoints where people are armed and have heard allegations of citizens being asked for ID before entering and a business asked to make a donation to be in the area. It's not nothing aggressive or violent or nothing like that. We, we didn't come out here for any of that. He says the community is welcome here where they plan to stand together. But when it comes to what they're holding out for, Brooks would only say this. We're hoping to see a better, a better, if not system society altogether. Protesters here have also come up to us today wanting to get out the message that businesses back here are still open, even though so many roads are blocked off. In Seattle, Natalie Swaby, King 5 News. If your business was damaged during the protests, King County wants to know about it and they may be able to help you financially. A new website was just set up which allows business owners to report property damage that has happened since May 25th. You have until July 17th to make your report and we can send you a link on how to report damages. Just text the keyword damage to 206-448-4545. Seattle Public Schools is reevaluating its relationship with the Seattle Police Department. I know the phrase defund the police it can be can sound scary, but what that actually means is a reconsideration of our values and our budgets. At today's school board meeting, district leaders discussed a resolution which would suspend the district's partnership with police for one year. It would include removing officers from schools, and this announcement comes after the Seattle Police Department used district property as a staging area while responding to local protests. For an unknown future for the West Seattle Bridge, the first task force meeting is underway tonight to determine what's going to happen next. Also, as restrictions are lifted, the number of coronavirus cases are on the rise. We'll tell you the hardest hit counties in our state. Plus, another American mall is dead. I'm Eric Wilkinson in Skagit County. How will they adapt in the future? We'll talk about it coming up.